All right, that is the absolute truth, and that is uh, what we've been looking at for the last uh, three weeks or so. Uh, this actually, I think, is the third message in this series that uh, I've called uh, The Transformed Mind. And we've learned about the transformed mind that we all need one. And why is it that we need one? Because we're all born lost. <laughs> no one in here was born saved. Uh, we're coming to a lost world. We are lost ourselves. We come into a corrupt situation where everything in this world pulls against us and pushes against us to move us as far away from God as possible, to keep us from being what God created us to be, to finding our purpose in life. One thing the devil fears more than anything else is that a believer would actually find their purpose that God created them for and operate in that purpose. Well, in order to do that, our mind has to be changed. Well, how, do you, how does your mind get changed? Well, we look, we've been looking at Romans 12, we just read it, uh, verses one and two, because it's the key to the whole transformation of your mind. And Paul tells us in two simple verses what this thing is all about. And he says in verse one, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So if you're gonna give your body to God and your body is going to become a living sacrifice to him, then obviously something has to change because he goes on to say in verse two, and do not be conformed to this world. Do not be pushed into this world's mold. Do not, do not become a schematic, a, a identical in thinking to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So if you're gonna be a living sacrifice and you're gonna give your body to God as a living sacrifice, you're gonna have to change the way you think because you can't think like the world and, uh, and give yourself to God and be used by God. Your mind has to be transformed. Metamorpheo is the Greek word. Metamorphosis is the English word we get from that and it's what happens to a caterpillar when it changes to a butterfly. It is a complete and total transformation. Everything about the way you are, about the makeup of your systems, about the way you live, about the way you operate. When a caterpillar goes into a cocoon, he has a whole different life. He has a whole different function. He has everything about him is different than when he comes out as a butterfly into this world. And that's what transformation means. It means a, a total change in everything in your life. Well, this total change in your life comes by the renewing of your mind. And when your mind is renewed, several things happen. You become much more refined in your thinking and your understanding about the will of God. The will of God can simply be described as the purpose God has for you. The will of God is not mystical. The will of God is not a treasure hunt. I know a lot of people talk about the will of God as if it's uh, some distinct something that is hidden somewhere, and if I can just find it, then my life's going to be great, like God sends us on a treasure hunt and gives us a Bible, and the Bible is the map to find the treasure, and the treasure is his will. So we began reading the Bible trying to find his will, and we search for his will, and if we get close to finding it, you know, four steps over, three steps to the left, and we get close to even accidentally finding the will of God, if God's not ready for us to find it, then he just moves it somewhere. And we spend our whole life chasing the will of God. No, no, the will of God is God's purpose for your life. And it's not mystical or magical. It is logical, rational, and reasonable. And there are many things that help you know and find the will of God for your life. To be successful in life, to me, is not to make a lot of money, not to have a lot of fame, uh, you know, not to be a powerful person or have nice things. To be successful in life 
is to, is to know the purpose God created you for and to be doing the purpose that God created you for. And, and that is the will of God. And according to this verse, the more our minds get transformed, the clearer the will of God becomes for our life the more refined our understanding of God's will, the more discerning uh, we get about the exactness of God's will in our life. At first, we're able, when our mind be first begins to be transformed, we can know what is the good will of God. The good will of God is just simply that God is good, that he wants good things for us. Just the general concept, the thought that God is not an ogre up in heaven. He's not mean looking to destroy us. He doesn't want to put the hammer on us. He didn't create a bunch of laws so he could hurt us with them. That God is a good God and that God loves us and God has a good things for our life. That's the good will of God. And then your mind becomes a little more reformed, a little more refined, and a little more transformed. And then you're able to understand the acceptable will of God. The acceptable will of God is simply what God accepts and what God doesn't accept. The, the, what you need to do to please God and what you do that doesn't please God. You get more information, you, you, you become more mature, you get more refined and discerning in your thinking, and you uh, concentrate not on just the fact that God's good, you already have that, but now you begin to say, God, what is it that I can do? What is it that you're pleased with? What is it that, that this world needs? Why did you put me? It's the acceptable will of God. But we're not finished as our mind continues to be transformed, and when it gets to full transformation, full metamorphosis, full, fully renewed, then we can know what is that perfect will of God. The perfect will of God is what God wants you to do. That perfect thing that God has for you, that, 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 that way of operating, that place of working, that, that, that style of life, that direction of life, uh, the perfect will of God. So this is an important thing. And this is why our mind has to be transformed because it's all about these kind of things. So you see that it's really essential that we don't become conformed to what other people think and the attitudes that other people have in life. That we are to be conformed to the biblical way of thinking and God's way of operating and acting. And the attitudes of God in our life are to be prevalent. So as I said, uh, we're gonna talk about attitude today. I see, if you got the outline, you saw how can I change my mind, or how can I change my attitude, excuse me. And um, this is the first message I've ever preached about attitudes, by the way. You, I know it's hard to believe in 50 years, now, I've mentioned attitudes before, but this is like a whole message about attitudes. Why? why? Why would we do this? I mean, are attitudes really that important in life? I mean, is it worth, is a, is a message on attitude, is it worth a whole message here, you know? Is there enough about attitudes to be important for us to take, you know, uh, the next two and a half hours to go over this and make sure you got it? <laughs> I mean, hey, you know, that's a lot of stuff, right? Well, let's think about it this way. I mean, just go with me a second. All right, Jesus died for us. He cleansed us. His blood has washed us clean from sin. His Holy Spirit has empowered us. He gave us his word so that we can have examples of what success and victory look like uh, in every area of your life. We've been forgiven of, of anything that's happened in our life. We're on our way to heaven, and we've been given every opportunity to live an overcoming life. But in order to move forward in that life, we must have the right attitude. A bad attitude ruins everything. If, if you have a bad attitude, it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you have a bad attitude, it doesn't, have, doesn't matter how many gifts you operate in. If you have a bad attitude, it doesn't matter what kind of education level you have because a bad attitude changes everything. But on the other hand, it doesn't matter uh, 
what kind of disadvantages you have. And it doesn't matter what is going wrong in any situation. If you have a good attitude, a good attitude also changes everything. God is on his throne, guys. God, has, God, God is for us. God loves us. God has done everything for us. God has provided everything for us. We've been singing about it, you know, for 30 minutes or so, about all the great things God says he'll do and does and work in our life. So what's wrong with our attitude? Well, let me, let me start this way. Let me give you some definitions of attitude. I mean, we're going to talk about it for two and a half hours. We need to know what we're talking about. And uh, so I have three definitions. These are right out of the dictionary, and I'm just going to read them. And uh, so we'll know what we're talking about. All right. First definition of attitude. A settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something. So an attitude, attitude could be described as uh, a pattern of thinking, a, a settled way of thinking. In other words, um, I've decided how I feel about certain things, about someone or something in life, and because of my upbringing, because of my education, because of the experiences I've had in life, because of the, uh, the emotions that I operate under, when certain things are mentioned or I experience certain things, I already have a settled set of understandings about these things. I have an attitude about these things. I can have, I, I, I can have a helpful attitude. I can have an optimistic attitude. I can have a negative attitude. You know, just a general way of thinking when something's mentioned in my life. All right, that's one definition. Second definition, the position of the body implying an action or mental state. So we often call this type of attitude body language or um, uh, uh, our posture <laughs> reflects this kind of attitude in life. Um, when I'm preaching, and I mentioned this to you just casually a while ago, when I'm preaching, I can look at the way your, at, your body attitude is and can tell a lot about what's going on in you as I'm trying to share with you, whether you're receiving this, if it's boring to you, if you're excited about it. There's just certain nonverbal communications that happen by your body, and your body reflects an attitude of life, and our body can reflect good attitudes or bad attitudes, uh, the expressions on our face reflect our attitudes. So the second definition is about how we reflect our attitude with our body, the way it moves, the way it is, how you're leaning, what you're doing, how you do. The Bible, the old King James Version of the Bible had used the word countenance for the, the word that's translated attitude. I think I have the scripture. Do I have Daniel 3 up there? All right, let me just read it to you. It's, this, is, this is how it's used. Then Neb this is Daniel. Then Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king, was full of fury, and the form of his countenance was changed, or his attitude. In other words, when Daniel saw him, he knew he was hot about something because of the way his countenance reflected his attitude. All right, third definition, and this one's gonna seem a little odd because I know that uh, we don't have a lot of aviation people in here, I don't think. Uh, this, is con this is a definition concerning an airplane. And you might think, what in the world would that be about? Well, I'm gonna, hopefully, I'm gonna apply this and, and you'll see, but this is the third definition of attitude. All right, third definition, the orientation of an aircraft relative to its direction of flight. Now, let me just say what that is. In an airplane, there is an instrument that is called an attitude meter. And the attitude means how the plane is flying in relationship to the horizon. This comes into play when you can't see the ground or it's dark 
Are there no distinguishing features down there that would tell you, am I level, am I done, down, up? An attitude, you can have a nose up attitude, which means I'm climbing. You can have a level attitude, which means I'm cruising. Or you can have a downward attitude, which means I'm crashing. <laughs> so you see how important this gauge is in an airplane, as a matter of fact. This is why John, John, John Kennedy Jr. Uh, flew his plane into the ocean. He was flying at night over the ocean. There are no lights, no distinguishing characteristics. It was overcast. He, could, he got disoriented about where he was. He either didn't look at his attitude indicator or he didn't uh, interpret it correctly or it malfunctioned. And what he did is he, he had no idea where he was. And he just flew his airplane straight into the ocean because he didn't look at the attitude director. So it's very, those things are very important. So of all the areas of importance in life, attitude is the most pervasive and profound uh, general characteristics that we have in our life. And changing our attitude is a precursor to changing anything in our life. If you're gonna make any changes in life, the first thing that has to happen is your attitude <laughs> has to be changed. So a change in your attitude may have the greatest single effect on your behavior and your success in life except for salvation. Only salvation could have a greater effect on your life in the area of your behavior and your practices in life and, and the success of doing what God has called you to do. And attitudes tend to run in groups. Like um, families can have attitudes. And when you go into that family group, you can tell what kind of attitude these people have. Uh, businesses have attitudes. If you go into certain chain stores, you can tell what the attitude of their, of their organization is. I mean, you go down here to Chick-fil-A, and does Chick-fil-A reflect an attitude? It sure does. Is it different than Hardee's? Yeah. Is it different from Wendy's? Yeah. I mean, it has its own attitude, and it reflects that. And all of the stores, most likely, I don't know every one of them, but most likely they all reflect the same kind of attitude. Churches have attitudes. Some have good attitudes, some have bad attitudes. I had a, uh, at Dale's funeral, or memorial service, a couple of weeks ago, there was a gentleman, he'd never been in our church, and after the service, he said, uh, Pastor, I, he said, I just want to let you know how much Deb talked about this church. She loved this church. And I had never been to this church, and she kept trying to describe this church to me. And he said, frankly, I would have never... Uh, thought it would, you know, I didn't picture it anything like it is. And he said, it just seems to be a wonderful place. And, and here's what he said. He said, it has a good vibe. Now, what is that? That means it has a good attitude. It means when you come in the door, you sense something about the attitude of the people that are involved in this church, whether it's a good church or a bad church or a forgiving church or an understanding church or a strict church or a legal church or a grace church or whatever it might be. It's the attitude. Now, John Maxwell, and I know only if you're probably a pastor or some kind of uh, uh, person that studies uh, churchology and stuff like that, would you even know the name John Maxwell? But John Maxwell is, used to be a pastor and now he's a motiva motivational speaker, Christian speaker. And he wrote a book called The Winning Attitude. And in this book, he gives nine little descriptions of attitude that just kind of give you an idea about how important attitudes are in life. Let me just read them. They're on a slide, each one. Number one, your attitude is the advance man of your true self. Yeah, people see the real you in your attitudes. <laughs> and your attitudes go before you and they reflect who you really are to people before you even say a word or, or do anything. All right, here's the second thing. The roots of your attitude are inward. In other words, your attitude is caused by something on the inside, but the fruit of your attitude is on the outside. 
Your attitude shows what's on the inside of you. All right, number three. Your attitude is your best friend and your worst enemy. And this is true. It can either be good or bad, and it can help you or hurt you. It can be your best friend or your worst enemy. Number four, your attitude is more honest and more consistent than your words. It reflects itself no matter what you say. And it's honest, and, it, and it's consistent. It says the same thing every time. Number five, your attitude is the thing which draws people to you or repels them. And we all can understand that. Number six, your attitude, oh, I like this. Your attitude is never content until it is expressed. Right? You want people to know what you think about things, right? How you feel. And you're not satisfied until somehow they know how you feel about that. Well, that's your attitude. It can't be, it can't be happy until it's expressed. Here's number seven, and I'm gonna, it, it, this looks a little uh, different, but I'm gonna uh, share with you what he means by this. Number seven, your attitude is the librarian of your past. Now, let me just share this, uh, what he said this was. When we go into our, our past, and we are retrieving past events, our attitude is the librarian. We either go in and, and be grateful and think about the good things in life or we're going to be ungrateful and think about the bad things in life. We're going to be forgiving or we're going to be bitter. Our attitude is the librarian of our life that goes back into the past and retrieves memories and interprets those memories for us. In other words, your life and everything that happens in your life, your attitude is what brings out either the positive things of your life or the negative. Your librarian goes and pulls your past off of the shelves and what it chooses to pull off the shelves is controlled by your attitude in life, either bitter or good or poor or, or, or ugly, whatever it might be. All right, number eight. Your attitude is the speaker of your present. You're always communicating through your attitude. And number nine, the last one. Your attitude is the prophet of our future. If you have a bad attitude, it'll likely keep you from having the future that God wants you to have. So never underestimate the power of attitudes. Let me give you five truths about attitudes. Here they are. Number one, you choose your attitude. They are our choice. The attitude I reflect is completely left up to me. I make that choice. I have a free will. God has given me a free will and I can choose whatever attitude I want to reflect. I want to read for you just a little short summary from uh, the book, Man's Search for Meaning. It was written by Viktor Frankl, who was a uh, psychiatrist uh, in the early 1900s, but I, I, it shows what I'm talking about. Viktor Frankl was born in Austria in 1905. As an adult, Frankl had the opportunity to get a visa for the United States. He turned it down and chose to stay in Vienna and care for his aging parents. In 1942, he, along with his entire family, were transferred to a Nazi concentration camp. The Nazis killed six million Jews, for the most part, by gassing them in concentration camps like Auschwitz. I mean, this is just my comment. It's just hard to imagine evil like that, isn't it? Six million people gassed for no other reason than being a Jewish race person. By the end of the war, only Victor and his sister had survived. Amid all the suffering and what conditions could have been worse, he said, I choose to suffer with dignity and regardless of what the Nazis do to me, I will never hate one of them. Frankel, Frankel died in 1997 at the age of 92, having lived a long and successful life as a writer, teacher, and lecturer of psychological treatment. But the point here is, he made a choice about the attitude that he had for the remainder of his life. 
And he said, no one can make me hate these people. And I choose not to hate a single one of them. So it wasn't his circumstances that controlled the choice. It was his choice to make how his attitude was. And we all choose our own attitudes. Second, second truth. Attitudes are not caused by people or circumstances. Uh, there is a deception that's been floating around out there, I suppose, since the fall of man. And this deception says, if my circumstances were different, I would have a better attitude. My attitude is caused because Bad things have happened to me. My circumstances are terrible, and if I had better circumstances, I'd have a better attitude. I want to show you that the Bible says that is absolutely not true. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were perfect people. God gave them perfect bodies. They lived to be over 900 years old. Now, may I say to you, if you are 900 years old, I mean, I'm going to say this right to your face now. You're old. <laughs> they had perfect bodies. They lived in a perfect place. God put them in a perfect paradise. God lived with them. He walked with them. He talked with them. They had a perfect set of circumstances. He, there was only one thing that God said you can't partake of, and that is... You can't partake of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. All of the others you're perfectly free to take, but not that one that's in the midst of the garden. Nevertheless, under the serpent's influence, Adam and Eve developed an attitude of being ungrateful and rebellious. And they took that fruit, and they ate it. Now, you could not have better circumstances than they had. But they had a bad attitude which they chose of their own free will. King David. King David, during the worst times of his life, he had a fabulous attitude. When King David was being hunted by Saul for those years, running over the Judean hillside, being chased by this madman who was the king and his army, trying to kill him every time he turned around, you know what David did? David wrote Psalms. David extolled the praises of God. David, and all of this danger, David maintained a, 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 a godly uh, humble, faith-filled attitude in life. But during the best of times, David was the worst. Like the time he was standing on his balcony looking at his next door neighbor and how beautiful she was and had an affair with her and she became pregnant and then he had her husband killed on the battlefield and married her to cover up his sin. And this was during some of the best, thing, best times of his life. So during his worst times, he had a wonderful attitude. During the bad times, uh, the wor better times in his life, he had a terrible attitude and a terrible, a terrible uh, uh, at, uh, disposition in life. So what, you know, what, that just, what it shows is, it shows that you can't connect attitude with uh, people or circumstances in your life. Uh, one more, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was arrested in a little city of Philippi for preaching the gospel. They threw him in prison. They beat him with rods they locked him in a jail cell, <laughs> and at midnight, 
instead of laying there licking his wounds and crying over what a bad deal he had and how God hadn't come through with what he should have come through, the apostle Paul is instead singing praises to God. (laughs) And the jailhouse already shaken, and you know the rest of the story. But the point is that Paul chose his attitude and it clearly was not connected to the circumstances in life. So you may be tempted to think my attitude's not right, but if my circumstances change, then my attitude is going to get right. But that's not true at all. Attitudes are not caused by people. They're not caused by circumstances. We choose our attitude no matter what. All right, third truth. Happiness is a chosen attitude, not a state of being. We choose happiness is what I'm basically saying here. It's not just the way some people are. You look at people sometimes that are happy and you say, oh, that's just the way they are. They're just born that way. They just have a nice life there. They're just, they have a good gene in them. They were the born disposition to being happy in life. But you're not born that way. We choose happiness. I'm going to, Carol Burnett, and I know you young people don't even know who she is, but these are the kind of people we grew up with. And she's still alive, by the way. She's 88 years old. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. But here's a little uh, historical summary of Carol Burnett's life. Carol Burnett, a brilliant comedian, was the daughter of alcoholic parents. Her grandmother raised her. As a child, Carol had neither a bed nor a bedroom. Instead, she slept on the couch. She studied under dim light in the bathroom. Carol had none of the things that most people would consider requirements for a normal, happy childhood. Despite her circumstances, though, Carol decided to be happy and to make other people happy as well. Happiness is a choice for all of us. Some people choose to be miserable in life. Have you ever met anybody like this? They can't be happy unless they're miserable. They're miserable and they want everybody else around them to be miserable. Yeah. Well, they choose that. On the other hand, people come from terrible backgrounds. They have terrible stories. They have horrible hardships in life. And yet, their attitude, despite their circumstances, is they choose to be happy. I found this quote Did you know that motivational speakers have a hall of fame? Did you know this? I didn't know that motivational speakers have a hall of fame. But they do, and this is from a hall of fame motivational speaker named Dennis Waitley. I think I put it, yeah, put it on screen. There it is. Look look at this definition. Here's his definition of happiness. Happiness cannot be traveled to, owned, earned, worn, or consumed. Happiness is the spiritual experience of living every minute with love, grace, and attitude. Gratitude, excuse me. Now, I want you to see this because this is exactly the opposite of what the devil tells you every day. The devil says to you, you can travel to happiness. Pick out a place and go on a vacation and you'll be happy. You can own happiness. If you just get some more stuff, you can be happy in life. You've heard this, right? You can earn happiness. Just keep moving onward and upward and, 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 and be successful and you'll be happy. Happiness can be worn. Get, get you a wonderful wardrobe, you know, look nice, uh, be sharp, uh, and you'll be happy in life. It can be consumed, drink this, take that, uh, you know, get in shape, uh, whatever it is, and you'll be happy in life. But, but happy, the truth is that, that if you don't have happiness right now, when you get all of that stuff that you consume and travel to and put on and all of that, you're still not going to be happy. You, 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 you can choose happiness at any point in your life because happiness, according to Waitley, is the spiritual experience of living every moment of my life with gratitude 
to God. It's an attitude. It's not thrust upon me. It doesn't happen to lucky people and, and not happen to unlucky people. It's a choice. Abraham Lincoln said it this way. By the way, I looked up this quote, and they said, to the best of anybody's understanding, Abraham Lincoln did say this. However, it wasn't written down at the time, but they attributed it to Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln said, we're just about as happy as we make up our minds to be. And that's true. All right, let me give you truth number four. God rewards good attitudes and disciplines bad attitudes. God rewards good attitudes. He doesn't move against good attitudes. He, according to the book of James, rewards a good attitude. And I'll, I'll share that scripture in just a second. Good parents understand this, by the way. You don't, you don't wait till your child develops bad behaviors and bad habits to discipline them. You must discipline them when their problem is still an attitude and hasn't developed into a behavior or a habit in life. Remember, we're talking about God also, not just good parents. One of the few paddlings that I received when I was in school happened to me in the fifth grade. My teacher in the fifth grade, and I can remember it as clear as, as right now. I was sitting in the desk. She said, told me to do something. I looked up at her, and she said, don't you turn your lip up at me, young man. And I said, what is turning your lip up at somebody? I'm thinking, what did I do? I didn't, I, <laughs> I didn't do anything. I didn't mean anything at the moment. Well, I don't know what turning up your lip meant, but she sure did. <laughs> and she, she paddled me <laughs> for turning my lip up. And when I had children, and of course, especially grandchildren, I have a bunch of them, I now understand what turning your lip up means. I've seen it a bunch of times. But when I got home that day from school, my mother asked me, well, how was school today? And of course, uh, I'm sure the principal had already called her about this, or my teacher. So I knew I might as well tell the truth about it. And uh, I, I tried to explain to my mother what happened that day. I said, Mom, I don't know what happened. I got disciplined at school today for turning up my lip, and, and I don't even know what that means, and I didn't do anything. <laughs> so I didn't know what turning up my lip meant, but my mama sure did, and she didn't like it either. <laughs> By the way, both my teacher and myself laughed about this later when I became her pastor. <laughs> now, about 25 years later, I'm her pastor, and we laughed about that. She still remembered it, by the way. Uh, whatever it was, it was bad. Good parents and good teachers don't wait until it becomes behavior. They immediately dis discipline poor attitudes. God always loves us, of course, but like a good human parent, God relates to us based on our attitudes. James 4, 6, listen to this. God resists, I think, is it on here? Yeah, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do you know what resist means? It means he fights against you. He wars against you. This is a bad fight, by the way, because you can't win this fight. The apostle Paul said, there's a good fight in life and a bad fight in life. He said, I have fought the good fight I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. The good fight, of course, is with the devil because with the weaponry of God, we can defeat the devil. The bad fight is with God because you're not gonna defeat God. So God fights against prideful people. Is pride an attitude? Sure it is. We can choose to be prideful or we can choose to be humble. James says that when we choose to be prideful, that we resist God. 
So when we're full of pride, and, and frankly, all of us have to deal with pride at some time in our life, truly, almost probably almost every day we have to deal with pride. But when we are prideful in life, we're, we're resisting God. We're in a battle against God. Um, Billy, I think it was Billy Pat. Pat, I think it was Billy that says this all the time. Um, God loves us just as we are but he loves us too much to let us stay that way. Think about that. God will discipline us because he loves us too much to not correct us when we're on the wrong path. I mean, really, uh, people that pat you on the back while you're going down in destruction, those people don't love you. Those people don't care about you. But God does love you and God does care. And when you're going in the wrong direction, you can expect to be disciplined by God. So when we're humble, though, we open the door for God to bless our lives and for God to move in our lives and reward our lives because God likes the attitude of humility and he rewards the attitude of humility. James 4 verse 10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. You know, sometimes all God's waiting on is for our attitude to change. He said, I'd love to lift you up. I'd love to bless you in life, but I'm not gonna bless that attitude of pride because that, you're going in the wrong direction. And he disciplines that, but he blesses us when we have right attitudes. All right, here's what the, here's what the book of Hebrews says that God does as a, as a good father to discipline our lives. We're just gonna read it. Hebrews 12, starting at verse seven. If you endure chastening, that means correction, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, in other words, we've all, if, God, if we're God's child, we've all been uh, chastened by him. But if you're not chastened, of which we've all become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. This is our earthly fathers he's talking about but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. I mean, that's what it's supposed to be, by the way. I mean, you, chastening is supposed to uh, uh, convince you that you don't want to act that way. <laughs> All right. For, uh, now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless, Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strength, look, this is, a, this is a unique little saying right here. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So Hebrews is saying, as your heavenly father, God's going to discipline you because he loves you just like your human fathers do. And when your human fathers discipline you, you give them honor. So you give God honor the same way you give them because he's doing this because he loves you. What is he doing? He's disciplining our attitudes. This is, this is why the writer of Hebrews has that little unique saying in there about strengthening the hands that fall and the feeble knees. That's reflecting an attitude. Let me, let me, let me mention this to you. Uh, do you remember when I mentioned to you the second definition that one, the second definition of attitude uh, 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 displays a disposition of the body, that the body reflects an attitude. It, it moves in certain ways, acts in certain ways. All right, now with that in mind, think about the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. Uh, turning up your lip, rolling your eyes, all, all that kind of stuff. All right, our daughter Amy 
had a very unique skill. Amy knew how to clean up her room without really cleaning it up. And, and, and for some reason, she loved to uh, leave her shoes laying out in the floor, uh, her clothes laying on her unmade bed, uh, her chest of drawers and, and, and dresser, clothes hanging, door, drawers open, clothes hanging out of them. Uh, of course, it, uh, I know that you can imagine that this didn't G-Hall with Tanya. And, uh, and of course, as Amy became a teenager, and this may be a word of, I don't know if, if it's comfort would be the right word for you or not, but up until Amy was 13 years old, Tanya was her queen, was her hero. Everything in Amy's life revolved around her mama. She loved her mama. She, everything, we, we, on her 13th birthday, we have a video of her receiving her gifts. And she, every gift she receives, she says, look, mama. She takes it to mama so that mama can approve it and, and be happy with her. Well, shortly after that, I guess she starts producing hormones and, uh, and mama becomes the enemy. I mean, everything mama says is no, it's wrong. She tr she's not going to do it. Uh, mama is the enemy. Now, this is the time when dad earns his living right here. You can't let that go on. So, of course, I have to step in. And everything I tell Amy to do, she's just delighted. Everything her mama tells her to do, it's battle royal. So I go in to Amy's room and say, Amy, this room cannot stay this way. You're going to have to get in here and clean this room up. And when I told Amy to do something that she didn't want to do, here was her attitude. <sighs> I've been practicing that. I mean, it was like this. Amy, get this room cleaned up. <sighs> Here are the, the hands that fall down and the feeble knees. <sighs> and, and so I knew, I knew that she didn't like what I had just told her to do. And, and if she... It, this girl 30 seconds before that was bouncing around happy and everything. But as soon as she gets commanded to do something that she's not doing this, the hands go down and the, and the knees get feeble because her attitude is now changed and she wasn't going to do that anymore. Well, God deals with, a, of course, I had to deal with that. Uh, Justin, get my belt. Aunt Justin standing right behind me, already got the belt. <laughs> During those days, he just followed me around with the belt. <laughs> because he knew I was going to have to get Amy, and he knew what that meant. <laughs> he just put it in my hand. And, uh, no, Daddy, no. Our attitude changed real quick with that. But, but God deals with you as his children. And let me say this about God. He disciplines you for as long as is necessary for you to change your attitude. Of course, I do the same thing. I did the same thing with Amy. Hey, if Amy's room wasn't messed up, I would have never had to go in there and say, get this room cleaned up. We would have never had to have any confrontation. As long as she was doing correctly, I didn't have to discipline her. But I had to discipline her as long as it was necessary to change her attitude once she displays that attitude. If I had told Amy to clean up her room and she had looked at me and said, Father, thank you for reminding me. I am going to get on this right now and I'm going to clean this room thoroughly and I'm going to put up everything in the closet and clean the drawers and please come back in a few minutes and examine what I've done and let me know if that's all right. If that had been her attitude, I, I, I would have just said, hey, <laughs> there's no reason to discipline her. 
she's going to do it. Great attitude. But no, the hands were hanging and the knees were hanging. And so she had to be dealt with. So when God says to us, forgive that person. Or God says, hey, they have a need. I, I want you to meet that need. And, and your hand, and hands go down. And, uh, you, do you know what they did to me? We're just like little brats that need to be disciplined. And God looks at us and says, look, children, I, I, I created you to be, not to be spectators. I didn't, I created you to be in my army. I, command, I, I created you to rule and reign with me. And because that's what my intention is for you, I'm going to grow you up so you can act like me. And I want you to be responsible. I want you to be mature. And I want you to live a life that can be, that I can get in and bless. So therefore, I'm going to have to deal with your attitude. So if you want some free parenting advice, and I know all of you are just waiting for it, discipline that attitude quickly and consistently. Two things now. Quickly, when you see that attitude, don't wait for it to become a behavior because it is going to become one. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. I can tell you that. Quickly deal with that and consistently. That means every time. You got to deal with that. And, 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 and because you want your children to grow up and be responsible and capable. You want them, if they're hired by someone else, when that boss looks at them and tells them something to do that they don't want to do, you don't want them, you know, uh, you want them to say, yes, sir, I'll take care of it right now. I'll just, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Because that's what God blesses. That's what blesses you in life. That's what takes you forward in life. Very important. Attitude. Fifth thing and last uh, truth about it. Attitudes precede and predict your future. Yeah, good attitudes precede and predict success, favor, and promotion. And bad attitudes precede and predict failure, disfavor, and demotion. You can predict many things that will happen in your life because of your attitude. Do you remember one of the definitions I gave you about the airplane attitude indicator. And I said, it reflects how the airplane is flying in connection in, with the horizon. It, it, it Put it up there. I think it's, I have a picture of it. This is, it didn't transfer. The attitude indicator is a little round uh, uh, device that's in the dash of the plane usually. It might be sitting on top. And it looks, and it, it has a, a black line usually and a light line, and it has some airplane looking wings here. And, the, and as the plane flies, it, it, the little wings tip. If the, if the wings tip in and the wings tip in, then it reflects in that attitude indicator. And if it goes up into the white, it's climbing. If it goes down into the black, it's, it's going down. And, and like I said, this, is, this, this instrument is there so that if you can't see the ground or if the weather's so bad you can't tell where you are and you're flying or at night, uh, you, you look at that and it tells you what the plane is doing. One of the things, like if the, if the wing is tipped like this, it, that's called the leans. And it's easy for this to happen. And if you don't correct that, you're just going to spiral down into the ground. So you have to know uh, if you're going to be safe, uh, what, what's happening with, with the attitude of the, of the plane. Now, listen, if, if, without an attitude indicator, the pilot only has his emotions and his personal judgment to guide this plane how he feels, how his body feels. Is he, does he feel like he's tipping or does he going up or down? I mean, vertigo and all this kind of stuff you've heard of before. You, you have to trust your indicator. You have to believe your indicator or else you're going to be in tremendous danger. So when you're going through 
difficulties. You're going through bad circumstances. You're going through critical situations or anxious moments in life. You can't trust your emotions and you can't trust somebody else's opinions about things. You need an attitude indicator and God's word is our attitude indicator in life. In the book of Psalms, David put his eyes on the Lord in the worst times. By his example, David shows us the attitudes that we should have when we're going through difficult times. When you cannot see outside or you are experiencing bad times, you can turn your eyes to the word of God. It will predict whether you get out or not. It will help you pick the right attitude rather than the wrong one. The word of God is God's attitude indicator. Abraham Lincoln, I, I don't wanna go into all that. Um, Y'all know Abraham Lincoln was probably considered one of the greatest presidents of our country. Most people don't know the story of his life. He was a great godly man, but he had all kind of setbacks in life. I mean, tremendously bad things. I didn't even know. Uh, had a very difficult childhood. He only had one year of formal education. Otherwise, he educated himself. One sister of his died in childbirth. Only one of his four sons lived past the age of 18. Lincoln was in a very difficult marriage with a bipolar wife. He had two business failures. He lost six elections, and then he was eventually elected president of the United States in 1960. I imagine during all those bad experiences, the devil came to him and said, Abe, why don't you just get loser tattooed on your forehead and lay down and die somewhere? What a pathetic loser you are. I mean, think about it. After the death of, oh, let's just say the third son, that would seem to be um, true or the loss of the fifth election or uh, you come home and you don't even know what to expect from the people that are there at your home, your wife and your family. I mean, these th years of this stuff and the devil, I'm sure, was convincing him he had no future, he had no life. He had, he's a pathetic loser in life. But the Holy Spirit was saying to him, just keep acting like president because one day you're going to be president, you know. And in the midst of defeat and disappointment, Lincoln never gave up. He allowed God to determine his attitude rather than his circumstances. Don't let your circumstances, don't let other people, don't let life's disappointments cause you to have a nose down attitude. A negative nose-down attitude will predict problems for your future. Put your faith in God and his word. Stay nose up, stay climbing. We often hear that attitude is more important than aptitude for success in life. Even if other people have more giftings, more talent, more intellect, they're, more, they're prettier, they're, 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 you can succeed over them with attitude. In my life, I want to tell you, the bad, the worst times that I've had in life, the more difficult times I've had in life are the times that I've learned the most. And God has brought me through those things. And, and it's all dependent on our attitude in life. It is the single most important characteristic in our mental life other than salvation itself. It will do more to change our life than anything else in life. And God says, have the right one. Be humble, I, I, I wanna bless your life. I've got great things for you. And, and, it, and if I don't have to keep disciplining you, we can go together on this thing. So we want the blessings of God. All right, bow your head with me just one second.